Thank you, Sherry. What a show we have for you tonight. The quicksand underneath old Casanova Bowen. He's sinking in it as we speak. Now, as you know, this government, well, it could cut petrol taxes. But as you know, this government has no plan on doing something that they have increased since they came to office. No, 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 way. no way. No, 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 no. Because anyone using a petrol vehicle is, of course, evil, less than. You see, the key to the future of Australia and doing something about our 1% of climate emissions, forget China and its 30%, forget the third world with its 30%, forgive Russia with its 20%. No, no, Australia can change the weather if we all move to electric vehicles. Now, I get it. For those that live in the cities, for those that do, short case, this might be the solution. One day into the future, yes, the cars that are very good when it comes to acceleration, and I get it as a rev head, but the reality is, is that they are not what Australians want to buy now. And even if they do buy them, they're so difficult to charge. And even if you do travel in long distances, there's so few places to charge them. At some point, the mousetrap may well end up being better. But right now, it is not. Now, Chris Bowen, of course, is doing everything he can to get everyone to change to electric vehicles by, on the very same day that they decided to increase petrol taxes, he was telling us that everyone's going to save money on electric vehicles or new fuel standards if they come into place. But the reality is that in Australia last year, 78% of all cars that were sold in Australia were utes and SUVs. The green and the orange. That's SUVs and the light commercial vehicles. These are the vehicles that people, of course, use because it's the right one for their family. They use because it's the right one for work, but it's not the right one for the Twitter set. So despite the fact that petrol taxes are increasing on Australians, the government will not cut those petrol taxes. They're trying to tell us that the new fuel efficiency standards, which are the same as America, I'll get to that in a second, where we are just as bad as Russia, that if these fuel efficiency standards are put into place, then rather than cars costing you more money, which they definitely will, you will, of course, save money. Their big number, by 2028, they say you'll save a grand. We know that by 2028 this will save uh, average consumers on each vehicle each year over $1,000. But then they just made up a new number. We were almost the only ones who told you about this. Thank goodness for the Australian keeping their eyes on it as well. The $1,000 promise that's just as impossible as the $275 promise on your power bills. Well, this was now suddenly going to go from a $1,000 saving, magically, it was going to become $1,800. Where, again, I read... The Energy Minister, Chris Bowen, has ramped up his sales pitch for the proposed pollution caps on new vehicles, promising motorists living in outer suburban and regional areas could save up to $1,800 a year. Well, the promise of $1,000 that became $1,800, well, it got supercharged today. The Minister for the Republic, yes, his full-time job is to talk about whether or not we should or shouldn't become a republic, and given the results of the referendum of hell no last year... The chances of us getting to any vote anytime soon is pretty useless. Yet still, this is his full-time job. In between it, of course, he has to pop up on television and sprout the talking points of the day. But the $1,000 saving that became $1,800 savings is now $5,000. Have a listen to this. They're just making it up. And we want to introduce some fuel efficiency standards that improve choice for Australian motorists and ultimately mean that they lower the cost of running their cars. It means that you won't have to put as much petrol in your car to run it every year. Um, so on average, Australians will save about $5,000 a year by 2028. Sorry? Where did this come from? $1,000 magically became $1,800 and now it's $5,000 is what they think you're going to save. Now, even if it was a slip of the tongue, it's a rather expensive one. And it proves that they are just making these numbers up. Now, remember, for the people to even maybe qualify for the $1,000, they have to buy the right type of new car at some time this year or next year. And then hopefully, if the sun's in the right place, if the wind's blowing in the right direction, if you hop on one leg, you might be able to stretch it out by $1,000. But of course, the cost of petrol will continue to increase because this government is obsessed with indexation. It means a couple of times a year they increase the amount of tax that comes on fuel. So simultaneously they're going to save you money while making money. You know it's not true. You know they're just making it up. 
And these numbers are just the same as, as I said, the $275 savings to power, which will never happen, the 500,000 jobs that were apparently going to appear in the green energy sector that will not happen. Best case scenario, it's 30,000. Yeah, these are just numbers that are the lipstick on the pig. Well, the Australians can see what the pig is, and they can see what the pig is often rolling in, and it ain't pleasant. It's, of course, what they like to feed when it comes to mushrooms. Get you in the dark and, well, feed you the obvious. But we are well and truly awake to what is going on here. You know the BS that is being put in place here. The other one, of course, is that Chris Bowen says we have to do it because the Americans are doing it. As we've said before, it is time for Australia to catch up with the rest of the world. These standards were introduced in the United States in 1975. But the fuel standards, which, by the way, are not as stringent as the ones that he's planning to introduce here, have got a whole bunch of exemptions. Those massive yank tanks, which, if you like a ute, one day maybe you'd like to broom around in. I like that they still have a V8. But everything from the Rams, the Silverados, all of these things, guess what? Well, they are actually exempt. In fact, analysis of the publicly available data shows in 2021, 45% of the F-Series trucks, and I think we've got a picture of those, those pickup trucks, well, they are excluded from the fuel standard. As is, Ram vehicles, where 33% of those vehicles are exempt, 15% of the Silverado utes are exempt. And in fact, the top three selling cars in the United States just last year, the F-Series, the Silverado and the Ram, so they want to tell you, we've got to do it because America's doing it, but the actual cars are even bigger than the ones we have here, are exempt from that process. And guess what? The exemptions are going to get bigger. Because as we learn via that far right-wing news outlet, the Associated Press, the Biden administration, perhaps as soon as this week, is going to go backwards on the standards that are even more generous than the standards Bowen wants to introduce here. Now, one of the reasons is because the union workers who build good old-fashioned combustion engine cars, well, they don't want to lose their jobs in the transition to EV vehicles. They know that while it might be the future, it's not the future in 2024. And those union workers, well, they're important, not just for votes, but for muscle, for Biden as he tries to beat Trump in November. So he's going to ease off the accelerator because that's what the union mates want him to do. So Chris Bowen, he's going to start to look a little confused here because the numbers that he's serving up are garbage. $1,000 savings and our magically $5,000 savings. We have to do it because the Americans do it, but the Americans are not just going in reverse, but many of the vehicles that are exempt are even bigger than the ones that he wants to ban here. And he's casting over Bowen because everything he touches, dot, dot, dot. You will have heard by now that, of course, Newspoll was not generous to the government. In fact, things are getting a little bit tighter. Any government that goes into an election at 51-49, the two-party preferred, well, it's essentially up for grabs. And that was the finding in today's news poll. that in two-party preferred, it is 51-49 in favour of the Labor Party. Now, because of preferences, because of the teals, they probably won't lose government, but they will be pushed into a minority. Now, I'll get into the details of just how big a minority he can afford to go into before he has to go shopping to the truly crazy people that are out there. But tonight, the Channel 9 newspapers and the Channel 9 television station put out their own poll, and it is terrible news for the Prime Minister. Now, of course, Albo thinks he is the solution. More Albo means more votes. Well, guess what? If you have a look at the Prime Minister's performance in recent weeks, 38% of people say that it's good or very good. That is down 17 points the same poll last same time last year. The number of people who say poor or very poor is spiking. Not only is there a direct move from people who said good to now bad, but people are now starting to move from undecided to bad. That is a trend that this government has to deal with. But of course, they pretend their Praetorian Guard and the press, more advice from Murfaroo will make everything okay. Well, again, the far right-wing news source, that is the Channel 9 newspapers, here's some of the comments of the people who were speaking to those that were doing the poll. The vast majority of them were negative. Albo's promising everything to everyone, but there's not enough money to do it all. Just look at the cost of living and healthcare. What's going right? 
Albanese, Albanese wasted too much time and money on The Voice. We could have done better things. Correct. $450 million, remember? They're not doing anything about the cost of living. Give the other guys a go. This is a government that's been around for two years. People now saying time to make a change because of what we talk about every night, what 80% of Australians say is the number one issue, it's the reason to ch potentially change their vote. Labor aren't really delivering anything and becoming complacent. Yes, it's the arrogance of each way Albo and his ministers who think they're going to lie to you that the fuel efficiency standards will now save you $5,000. It's gone up by four grand a couple of months since they announced the policy. On the same day, they increased petrol taxes. The current government seems out of touch on immigration. Now, if the Prime Minister is, dare I say, scratching his head, trying to work out, why are these numbers going the way they are? I've done lots of amazing things. Here's the reality of Australia right now. Yes, they passed a law to deliver too little, too late tax cuts, and I'll get to those in a second, but they don't kick in till July. But all of the financial problems that were there for you last year are still there for you this year, and nothing is coming out of the government. Instead, I bang on about petrol because it is something a simple change could save people money today. But instead, I oh know we should have the complicated change because it might save somebody who's lucky enough to buy the right type of new car $5,000. Garbage. Rubbish. Baltish. Here's the reality of why polls are turning on Albo. Because he has not and will not deliver reality for people who are having problems with cost of living. The consumer website Finder puts out an interesting survey, and this is a survey of more than double the number of people that will answer questions like News Poll or Morgan. It's about three and a bit thousand people. Well, as I told you last week, nine million people in this country have less than $1,000 in the bank. That's why the Prime Minister can say, I'm doing everything about cost of living. He can hold Toto as hard as he likes. He can think that we're going to have a wedding tent recovery. The reality for Australians are that one in five Australians, 20%, say they've got nothing in the bank. Nothing. That's 4.2 million Australians. 9.4 million have less than $1,000 in the bank, but even then, they've only got $210 in the bank, which isn't enough to even replace a flat tyre. Finder again concludes that three out of four people, 76% of Australians are stressed about their current financial situation. So the Prime Minister can tell us, as he told his MPs, that they have a quote-unquote solution to cost of living, which is a too little, too late tax cut that doesn't arrive for months. Remember, the best case scenario is not the thousands of dollars per year, it's what you get back per week. And if you're earning $45,000 or less, it'll be 15 bucks a week. Oh, I could wrap myself in giggles at $22 a week, $32 or $41, $120 a month. And that's for people over $100,000, you know, the evil buggers who, of course, should pay their fair share of half in tax. If you want to know where the Prime Minister's ratings are, where they are right now, I'll tell you. According to, again... Finder, millions of people are looking for a second job. And that's on top of the almost one million people who already have a second job to make ends meet. According to the Bureau of Statistics, again, that far right-wing think tank, 970,700 people currently have more than one job. Before Albo was the Prime Minister, it was 860,000 people. So up by 100,000 in two years. Five years ago, it was 760,000 people. Up, up. All of this, of course, was a reason to change the last government. Well, I tell you what, it's a reason not to reappoint this government. And people will register a protest at the upcoming election, be that if a couple of interest rates go their way towards the end of this year or definitely next year. Again, Finder says when one gig isn't good enough, they say 6.7 million people are searching around on the internet right now. Because, again, they did a survey, this time 1,000 people. 32% of Australians, that's 6.7 million people, feel financially pressured enough to have to look for a second job. Prime Minister, that's why your poll numbers are tanking. Because while you may have been able to squeeze one out when it comes to Dunkley, the reality is that the bonfire of inaction on cost of living that saw you last year take... $1,500 away from 10 million workers with no promise of it coming back. And the best case scenario is $120 a month. Or for the people who need it the most, 
$15 a week. It's a political solution, not an actual solution to people's problems with cost of living. That means no one has money in the bank and millions of people are now looking for a second job on top of the full-time work they are currently doing because they can't make ends meet. Yet your government is going to make it more expensive to buy a car. Your government is going to increase petrol taxes and your government is obsessed with an energy transition that costs a trillion dollars and means our power bills are going up, up, up. And even if they're ever so slightly down in the next market offer, in South East Queensland they're still going up. In regional Australia they're still going up. In the capital city of Sydney they're going down by 1%. Let alone the number of people who are trying to pay off a house right now. Now people have now got used to the idea that the choke that is the interest rates, and I know you're trying to rig the Reserve Bank to get your union mates to get onto the Reserve Bank to eventually start cutting interest rates so they can do it close to the 1st of July, so you can have an election sooner rather than later, and we know you're planning one sooner rather than later because, of course, they're going to change the funding rules. They're going to give Pocock and others extra Senate seats in the territories. The reality for Australians compared to when this bloke was not the Prime Minister. After a dozen Albo and Chalmers-led interest rate rises, if you are paying off a home loan of $500,000, you've had to find 14 and a half grand. From where, I don't know. The same people that are looking for jobs, that have no money, no money in the bank, are trying to search for an extra $21,000 a year since this bloke took over. Now, it's all well and good if you're a federal politician. You've got the highest pay rise in 10 years. If you're paying off, like many people in Sydney, Melbourne and Central Brisbane are trying to pay off more than a million bucks, they've had to find 30 grand. Now, I know that the left wing think that anyone with a $1 million mortgage is just Scrooge McDuck. They've just got a vault out the back and they swim in the dollar coins. Rubbish. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum, the... Tension in the economy is obvious. We've been in a per capita, i.e. family recession, for months. The Prime Minister can only sell his BS so much before Australians will actually look at their own circumstances. I repeat, find your power bill from May of 2022. If by the next election it's $275 cheaper, vote Labor. But I guarantee it won't be, so don't. Don't reward their BS and their lies. Their lies would they tell you that you could save $1,000, $1,800, $5,000 when it comes to the fuel efficiency standards. And we've got to do them because America's doing them, but America's not even doing the ones we're trying to do, and they're going to roll back the ones that currently exist. So there's no mystery about where news poll is today. And there will be all the tricks in the world and we'll have a scare campaign about nuclear and we'll have the dirt union of the Prime Minister telling us that Peter Dutton's going to eat babies and force children to only eat one meal every three days, whatever garbage they're going to make up. But we're seeing today a move, and a move since the last election. And it is that the Labor Party's vote is down. The Labor Party's vote in the last election was one of the worst it's had in a century. They were only able to form government because of Greens' preferences. According to news poll today, their primary vote's at 32%. That's down from the last election. The Liberal Party's is up since the last election. The Greens is up since the last election. The other, independents, UAP, that's up as well. But have a look at little old One Nation. The party that nobody talks about, the party that nobody will interview, well, their national figure right now is 2% higher than it was at the last election. Now, of course, preference deal with One Nation will be terrible and evil. What about a preference deal with the Greens? The people who openly pose with photos of where the Jews should go, which is a bin. No, no, no scandal about that. Instead, the scandal will be about the evils of one nation. Now, if there was an election that was held any time soon, the government would go from its very slim majority, and while the Labor Party means that if you ever cross the floor or speak against them, well, they'll give you life, so basically as soon as you've got a majority, well, it doesn't matter. You can pretend you've got 90 seats, but the reality is, unlike Abbott, Unlike Rudd, they don't have it. Unlike Howard, there's no backbench to burn, but there is going to be a burning of the backbench. They'll go from their current number, they'll lose four, and there'll be a minority by three. The coalition, because of the Teals, will get nowhere near government, but they'll go up 
to 62. The Greens will hold four and everything else stays the same, including the 10 independents. But can I give you a little roadmap here? If it was 73 seats, the government, of course, will be returned. And I tell you who will prop them up. Helen Haynes. Helen Haynes, left-wing, independent, in the seat of Indi. She'll back the government, no questions asked. Andrew Wilkie, well, he'll do it before the election's even called. Rebecca Sharkey, she'll end up going with the party with the most seats. She said that in the past. So there you go, you've got your three people that hold them up together. Add to that, maybe Bob Catter, apparently him and Albo are mates. But if it's any lower than 73, they're going to start to get themselves into trouble. They're going to have to go shopping to a couple of the left-wing teals out of Melbourne. If it's any lower than 70 seats, and that is the upper end of things, but that's when the Greens start to come into play. But that's a mess. Which brings us to Tasmania. I feel for you, Tassie. I really do. Good people. But I tell you what, the election results have produced an absolute farce of a parliament. The Premier, of course, is on the phone today. He is the one in the box seat. He's the one with the most seats, and the expectations are that they will be able to get a couple more that get them to only need a couple of people that aren't card-carrying members of the Liberal Party to return fully as a government. Latest count. We're going to talk about this for the next couple of days. You need 18 seats to form a government. Liberals currently have 13. They could win three more. Best case scenario, 15, uh, 16 seats. Most likely 15 is where they'll end up, needing three votes to get them over the line. The Labor Party, nowhere near it, but they may get another two. The Greens, stable at four. Lambie has two, could end up with one more. Best case scenario, two more, but most likely one more. The Independents stay two. So... If you end up 15 plus 2 of the independents, well, you still need the Lambie network. So Lambie is going to make the decision here. The same lady who had candidates in the market, who she openly admitted, they openly admitted, had no policies, who before the election said they had no idea which party they were going to back, the one who on election night was saying she didn't like the Liberals because they campaigned against her, because apparently she's the only one allowed to play a bit of politics here, but the reality is that things are starting to soften and, yes, at this stage, Lambie's people look like they're going to have to back in the only party that's going to be able to form government. There's an outside chance that Labor will find a way, but they'll have a new leader. Reports this evening uh, via the Mercury is that uh, the three-time loser who's been their leader, well, she's going to get the shove. And whether that ends up being the change that's needed for a hodgepodge of everyone but the Liberals to form a government, we'll all learn together. But as for Jackie Lambie... And Jackie Lambie's Crazy Cat Lady Act, it is very successful, and because of the small number of people that she needs, in the North and the North West, she will be able to continue remaining a feature of Australian politics. But a person who carries on like this is not the type of person that you want in charge of who is going to be running a government, which, of course, has to deliver services. Unlike federal politics, where they can have sort of these big, lofty conversations, this is nuts and bolts. State politics, local council, is nuts and bolts. And speaking of, here is the Senator today telling us what her latest demand will be. What we'd like to see is some transparency coming out of the Parliament of, in the state of Tasmania. Is the Liberal Labor Party, if we've got a form government with them, does that, you know, does that mean that they're going to be transparent? It comes down to trust. Trust is the magic word here. What I want to see first and foremost is them putting Tasmania first. What does that even mean? Honestly, what does it mean? I mean, obviously the Premier of Tasmania is going to put Tasmania first. The Premier of South Australia, the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory. What's, what's the example of them not putting Tasmania... What does that mean? Now, we know that she doesn't like the stadium, but, of course, you can't have the team unless you have the stadium. That's a deal that's been done by the AFL. Now, you can think what you like, but people have had their say. If this was apparently the great electoral poison, it would be a Labor looking to minority government, not the Libs. But seriously, this was a person who was telling us yesterday that the people that she expects to be elected may not even pick one because they need to be on training for the next three years. Now, I get it. The Catherine Wells great on breakfast television and everyone loves it because Jackie's in your corner. But I guarantee you, I'll make this prediction. Between now and when eventually a government is formed, she will at one point say, unless the Premier goes, then I'm not going to back him in because he was mean to me at the election. Well... How do you think you won seats? Because you were mean to people in the election. That's what happens. It's contested. For his part, the Premier is trying to be as polite as possible. But we'll see where this goes. Now, another one. Victoria. 
I'll make Daniel Andrews. The final chapter written about the reality of his premiership. Incredibly successful electorally, you can't argue. Multiple election wins. But one of the people who has constantly been ringing the bell about what really happens behind the scenes when this bloke was in charge and now that his mini-me's in charge, it's going to be exactly the same, was the former boss of the Corruption Commission there, a bloke called Robert Redlick. Now, Robert Redlick talked around about a thing called grey corruption. This is when, essentially, everyone who works for the public service only doesn't want to upset the minister, so you give the minister whatever they want, no matter how stupid it is. And then there's another one who said goodbye today, and that's Deborah Glass. She's done at the end of the week. She's the ombudsman. Now, I don't know this lady, never spoke to her in my life, but she is the exact example of the type of person that you need calling balls and strikes and actually being an umpire on how crook your government is. You see, she went them on the red, red shirts. She's gone them on the waist of things like the Commonwealth Games. And today she talked about a legacy of fear. Now, all of this was able to be achieved because on day one, this bloke sacked the head of the public service and it sent a message to every single person in the public service, do what Dan says or Dan's going to do you over. And just as it is in Queensland, when one side of politics has been there for the best part of 30 years, minus a three-year little blip a long time ago, everyone knows the whole thing's stitched up. You either work overtly for the party in the minister's office or you work kind of for the party and you don't disrupt when it comes to the public service. Again, a culture that the Ombudsman does not believe is going to change under the mini-me who is now the Premier of Victoria. She gave a report today, about 50 pages in length, and it shows what she has learnt over 10 years of a culture of fear. When the government runs roughshod over everyone, can do no wrong, shuts everyone up, and even when they're caught doing the wrong thing, pretends they haven't read the letter, like Andrews did about the former IBAC boss. She said this today. She says it hit her when the head of the public service was ousted for giving frank and fearless advice on the first day Daniel Andrews became Premier. That was a legacy of fear, yes. I mean, that, you know, the, the impact of that was felt by 50,000 public servants. Here's the point. Victoria has changed forever for the worse. It is up to the media to absolutely focus on what the umpire says about what the government does wrong. It is up to the parliament, and they do not have control in the upper house, to actually change the laws that make sure that when the umpire says something, it has to be listened to. But surprise, surprise, the current Premier who is there because she's going to continue the great work of Daniel Andrews, well, she says, nothing to see here. I would take um, respectfully a different view to the Ombudsman. Every government that I've been involved in over a number of years, um, policy matters are carefully thought through. Roll up, roll up, step right this way, ladies and gentlemen, it's the kooky Canberra Clown Show. And this week it travelled all the way to the USA, bigger and better than Barnum and Bailey. It was, of course, the greatest sideshow of them all, Kevin the Clown, seen here at the Australian Embassy in Washington. Oops, sorry, wrong photo technical glitch. I mean, here's Kevin the Clown, seen here, waiting for the oceans to rise and global boiling to subsume the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C. Yes, indeed, the headline act in the Canberra Clown Show this week came from the clown known as Krusty, or rather Mr. Crud, who made headlines around the world without even trying. Quite a skill. All it took was a couple of honest comments from the man who is likely to be the next US President Donald Trump, assessing the personality and talents of our Australian ambassador to the US, Kevin Rudd. He won't be there long if that's the case. I don't know much about him. Uh, I heard he was a little bit nasty. Uh, I hear he's not the brightest bulb, uh, but I don't know much about him. But if, uh, if he's at all hostile, he will not be there long. So, in honour of this undisputed legend of the Canberra Circus, the man who wears the crown of Clown King of Labour, here's a couple of his most famous circus acts. First up, Charlie Chaplin, eat your heart out. Here's Mr Crud trying to read a couple of lines on the auto cue. Uh, mate, this is just impossible. Uh, I get to the very end, I just, it's, yeah. And tell me it's in the embassy to just give me simple sentences. I mean, I've said this before. Hey, tell a bloody interpreter. This 
language. Brilliant comic timing from Mr. Crud. But this man at his peak had many more talents. Here he is doing one of his most famous clown acts, drinking a glass of water at the same time as swearing profanities under his breath. Don't try this at home, kiddies. Tell them to cancel this meeting at six o'clock, will you? I don't have the patience to do it. But of course, nothing ever brought the big top down as fast as Mr. Crud's famous I'm a Chinese linguist expert sketch. <laughs> Great stuff. Meanwhile, speaking of Chinese clown shows, the Chinese State Circus, no, not that one, this one, fresh from standing room only performances in Beijing's Great Hall, hit Canberra this week with another favourite Labour elder clown, the hugely gifted PJ Keating, stealing Penny Wong's thunder by entertaining the visiting Wang Yi Circus all by himself, as Sky's Kenny Healy reported. The comment that will raise the most eyebrows, according to Chinese media, Paul Keating told Wang Yi that China is contributing to regional peace and stability. Now that's after Foreign Minister Penny Wong held frank discussions uh, with her Chinese counterpart the day before, where she raised China's aggressions in the South China Sea. But of course, as is always the case with an old stand-up comic like PJ, he saved his best lines for last, hilariously declaring China, quote, does not pose a threat to other countries. And wait for it, this is a cracker, a killer even. China is contributing to regional peace and stability. Great stuff, PJ. But try as both those former Labour clowns, sorry Prime Ministers may, try, they can't hold a candle in the slapstick pie in the face stakes to the current clown show led by Al Bozo and Bobo Bowen. <laughs> yes, indeed, this week's Pie in the Face Award comes from none other than the brilliant Terry McCran, writing in the Australian newspaper, who delivered a veritable kitchen of pies in the face to Labour's front bench. Quote, it is almost as impossible to overstate just how utterly and dangerously and destructively chaotic the overall government of the country has become in the less than two years under Prime Minister Anthony Albanese as it is to comprehend just how fundamentally and even embarrassingly inept and just plain awful they have been almost all the individual ministers. He writes, I invite you, says Terry McCann, McCann, to go through the entire ministry, one by awful one. And then he goes on. There's Indigenous Affairs Minister Linda Burney, who, says Terry, backed by the entire media, corporate and broadly elite establishment, succeeded, quote, in turning an 80% yes vote into a 60% no vote. You go, girl. Disability Minister Bill Shorten, seen here doing his almost perfect impression of Laurel and Hardy, also gets a mention presiding over what Terry calls, quote, an explosion in the cost of NDIS on track to dwarf the entire social security budget, he wrote. Terry then gives a slow hand clap to the outstandingly incompetent duo of, quote, the minister for utterly out of control immigration, Andrew Giles, and his putative boss, Claire O'Neill. Next in Terry's list of incompetent circus acts are Bowen and Burke. Yes, Bowen and Burke. No, not these two boxing celebrities from Louisiana who in 1893 in New Orleans slugged it out in the longest boxing match in history. No, Terry's referring to this Bowen and Burke, the comedy duo of incompetence from Western Sydney. Terry calls Chris Bowen the most destructive minister of them all, who is hell-bent on destroying our electricity system with an almost unbound relish in the shortest possible time. Closely followed by the other Western Sydney clown, Terry calls the minister for taking us back to the 1970s with his regressive industrial relations laws that combine the worst of the past 
with all the hyper destructive 21st century woke add-ons. Tony Burke, has there ever been, asks Terry, two ministers in the one government that so seamlessly combine utter incompetence and supreme confidence in their inabilities. Great stuff, Terry. And above all, concludes Terry McCann, sits a PM who quite simply hasn't the faintest clue, who seems to think leadership is about swatting from conference to conference and wearing the right hat, which takes us back to where we started. Two clowns, but who gets to wear the hat? Yeah.